and King James, New King James, actually used the Roman name instead of the Greek name. What's the Roman name for Artemis? Diana, that's right. Diana is the Roman name for Artemis. And this was actually the temple of Artemis, or Diana in Ephesus, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So tourists flocked to Ephesus to, to see this, this incredible structure. And of course, uh, this is going to cause a big uproar when Paul begins to teach that Artemis is an idol, is, is a false god, is not a true goddess. And this is going to anger particularly whom? Who gets really upset about this? And I, what's that? The idol makers, right, the silversmiths. Because they would make little images of, of Diana or of Artemis, and they would sell these as souvenirs. Well, when, when word starts spreading that this is a false goddess, she's not a real god, she's not deity, she's not divine, uh, she's something that was created by men, that doesn't set too well with the silversmiths. Because now you're hurting their wallets. And, and that's really what they're upset about. They're upset that their business is being interrupted. But, you know, here's, here's this goddess, and, and now we see what's left of her temple. Uh, and this is what they, you know, this, this, this is actually just a reconstructed column. And, and so up until them putting this back together, there was really very little remaining of the temple of Artemis. Uh, and, and you can kind of see that fortress on the hill uh, that lies. So, so she was out, this, this temple was outside of the Ephesus that Paul knew. You had to walk about a mile to get to the temple of Artemis from those ruins of Ephesus. Now it's Ephesus is one of those sites that you can still see or get a pretty good idea of what the town may have been like in Paul's day. I mean, these are the ruins of Ephesus during the first century. Again, it started out on that hill that now has the medieval fortress. It moved to this site about, uh, they, they estimate maybe about 1,000 B.C., about a millennia before the days of Paul. So, so this particular, these ruins, and it kind of wraps around, and, and the great theater where there's going to be the riot is on the other side of this hill. This was probably the first Grecian theater that they built, and then they built a much larger theater next to the commercial agora, which would be where you find all the businesses and everything. Uh, so, but this is uh, first century. Uh, this is uh, the streets go back to long before the time of Christ. So Paul would have walked down uh, this street as he worked there in Ephesus. He's going to be there for quite some time. He's going to be there for almost three years working there in Ephesus. Now, this structure was not there. It was built in 110 A.D., and, of course, Paul is here uh, mid-century, mid-first century. So he's there in the 50s. Uh, Going to be executed in the mid to late 60s. So, so Paul did not see this library. It was the library of Celsus. It was a, a, a famous library after it was constructed. But it wasn't again constructed until A.D. 110. But these gates were there. Uh, these are called the gates of Mosaic and Mithridates. Uh, and, and they were two wealthy freemen, businessmen, that built this in honor of one of the Roman emperors or one of the rulers, one of the rulers at that time. So this was built before the time of Paul. So Paul would have walked through these gates as he worked there in Ephesus. 
Again, I th- okay, yeah, I've got the name. The, it, it was built in to honor Augustus and his wife and his son-in-law when they made a visit to Ephesus in the 3rd century B.C. Okay, now this is the, the theater that most likely the riot took place in because it's located next to the commercial agora, which is where you would find all the businesses and all the shops and that kind of thing. So this is where the silversmiths would have set up shop. So most likely when they get really upset and and they have their riot and it says they all rushed, rushed into the theater. Let me go back. Okay. When it said they they rushed into the theater, probably went from this commercial area into the great theater there in Ephesus. And uh, this is the roadway that's leading from the theater uh, to the bay area, that old harbor. This again, some of the shops that would have been in that commercial area, the commercial agora. Uh, The road that leads to the harbor is called the Arcadian Way. And, And you know, you can just imagine the citizens and silversmiths in this theater, uh, how long did they carry on? Well, for two hours, they shouted out, great is Artemis or Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. And, and Paul, he wants to, he's outside. They've dragged some of the Christians with them into the theater. And what does Paul want to do? He wants to go into the theater and offer defense on what they've been teaching. And the brethren wouldn't permit him. Basically, they say, if you go in there, they're going to tear you apart. So, you know, you can just imagine Paul somewhere discussing with the brethren, I I need to go in there and make a defense. And the brethren saying, no, you're not going to go in there. Uh, There's a riot going on in there. So to me, it just helps to make that a little more real to see where they were shouting this out for two hours there in Ephesus. Again, in this shot, you can see from the theater, the Arcadian Way. And then this is the silted-in harbor area. So that's where, in Paul's day, you would have seen the mast of ships and all rising up out of the harbor. Uh, and and so that, that was the ancient harbor. All right, now that gives you an idea of where we're talking about. Let's go back now to Acts chapter 19. And verse, verse 8 again, he goes into the synagogue, speaks boldly for three months, talking to them about this new kingdom, everlasting kingdom, that the Messiah had established. But it says in verse 9, and this is Paul, Paul has encountered this in all of his missionary journeys. He says, but when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them. So where's he departing from? Where had he been teaching? In the synagogue. But then again, as as happened in in most cities, you get a group of Jews. They heard the, the message of this spiritual kingdom. And it says some were hardened or became hardened. What hardened them? I mean, what caused them to to bow up, so to speak, and say, we're not going to listen? The message, the truth. And and really, it depends on the heart as to the response that truth will make, the response they will make to truth. I mean, you get a good heart, and truth melts that kind of heart. You get a dishonest heart, and truth melts hardens that heart because they don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. And Paul was telling them some things that they didn't want to hear. I mean, the Jews had been expecting the kingdom that Jesus was going to set up is going to be this physical kingdom and he's going to restore the Jewish nation to the, to the glory days of the time of Solomon. That, that our kingdom's going to have its borders spread out and, and our Messiah 
is going to be this powerful divine being that is going to rule from Jerusalem and he's going to rule with a rod of iron like the prophecies have been telling us. And any nation that tries to go up against us, he's going to just wipe them out and obliterate them. And, and we are going to be the number one superpower when Messiah comes. That's kind of what they were thinking. And now, Paul is telling them, the kingdom is here. And they're going, where? And he's saying, well, it's like Jesus said. You can't say, look here and the kingdom's here, or look there and you can see its borders there. He says, the kingdom of God is within you. This kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And you'll find it wherever you find hearts that have bowed down to the king. That's where you're going to find this spiritual kingdom. Well, they didn't want to hear that. They were still wanting their physical kingdom. And so when Paul gave them this message concerning the things of the kingdom of God, they were hardened. They did not believe. They spoke evil of the way before the multitude. And so Paul withdrew from them. And he says he withdrew and withdrew his disciples, those that had been listening to him. Then he began to teach in the school of Tyrannus, uh, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And Paul continues this, verse 10 tells us, this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So it started out in Ephesus three months teaching in the synagogue. Then the Jews began to stir up trouble, began to turn people away from him. So he leaves the synagogue, goes to the school of Tyrannus, and there he's going to teach for the next two years. And, and a lot of good is being done there in Ephesus. It says that, that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now how could that be? It is a hub city, that's right. And you've got people coming into port. I mean, Ephesus is kind of the entryway into Asia Minor. And so they're coming into port, or if they want to head west into Achaia or on into Italy and Rome, they'll be coming through Ephesus. Lots of traders are passing through here. And as and traders were one of your main sources of news. I mean, they couldn't turn on the 6 o'clock news at night. And so when a trader came through, he didn't have any trouble attracting crowds. And that, of course, helped his business as well. But to bring in that business, what would the traders do? Give them news of what's going on in the outside world. Of what's taking place in other places where the traveler has been. And so it would only be natural that as these guys went out and as disciples were made in Ephesus and would go out to different parts of Asia Minor, they would be telling people of this new kingdom. Or the traders would say, wow, there's, there's a really new popular religion that's kind of be centered in Ephesus right now. And, uh, and so this is how word would have spread out. And, and the gospel was reaching a lot of different people, both Jews and Greeks. Now something else that was going on is in verse 11. Now look at verse 11. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So what's happening? I, and the televangelists, they, they've, uh, they put their own spin on this. I mean, it's not, a, I, I, you don't hear so much about it today, but in the 60s and 70s, it was really popular to order your holy handkerchief or to order, you know, some relic from a televangelist and he would promise healing of course, now it came at a price. You had, to, you had to pay for it, plus shipping and handling, I'm sure. And, and they would send you, you know, these relics or this handkerchief that this televangelist 
had prayed over saying that it'll give you a healing. Uh, they get that here. Only difference between them and what's going on is that the handkerchiefs and the aprons that had been in contact with Paul worked. They worked and a lot of people were healed because of that. Now what was the purpose of God working these unusual miracles in Paul? Because even Luke says this is not the way it usually worked in the first century. Well, what was the purpose? Always the purpose of miracles is to help the preaching of the gospel, to confirm the word that's being proclaimed. Uh, we have looked at it, and we, we refer to it often in Mark 16. You know, turn back to Mark 16 very quickly. And Jesus even says in Mark 16, look at verse 17. He says, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So, Paul, so Jesus ascends. We know in Acts chapter 1 that the apostles went back because he said, go, wait in Jerusalem. You'll receive power from on high and you will be my witnesses beginning in Jerusalem. So they do that, and it says, after they departed from, from Jerusalem, verse 20, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And that was the purpose of them being able to perform these miracles. It really wasn't just so someone would be healed. Uh, do you remember Paul referring to the fact that we, we had to leave Trophimus in Miletus and he was sick, sick almost to the point of death? Well, come on, Paul, give him a handkerchief. I mean, you know, lay your hands on him, heal him. Why didn't they do that? The purpose wasn't to rid the world of disease. The purpose was to convince unbelievers that these men had a message from God. That was the purpose of the miracles. And that was the purpose because, you know, you start saying, Paul couldn't be everywhere all at once. And God apparently saw fit to, to provide a way so that that miraculous power could be taken elsewhere. And others could be convinced. They're saying, you know, this, this was a handkerchief. That, that Paul had, and look at the power that it still holds to where they would listen to the message. And so it says that the handkerchiefs, aprons brought from his body to the sick, the diseases left them, the evil spirits went out from them. Well, things kind of become popular during our day, right? I mean, just think about the fads that, that come and go I mean, what, what, what happened to the, the little twirly things that all the kids had two or three years ago? Do you see those anymore? Why not? I mean, you know, to date me a little bit more, you know, when, when I was a freshman in college, I had a baby blue leisure suit. And some of y'all are asking, what's a leisure suit? It was a fad in the late 60s and 70s. That's what a leisure suit was. Um, wouldn't be caught dead in one now. Nobody's wearing a leisure suit, are they? But it, it's a fad. Well, people kind of get on the boat and, and follow the fad. Well, the fad... And some of their ways of thinking was healing, casting out spirits. So some of the Jews, look at verse 13 now. It says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, what's itinerant mean? Travelers. So they traveled around. What did they apparently try to do? 
And this, this was a popular practice. It had been a popular practice since the restoration of the Jewish nation after the Babylonian captivity. There were those within the, the Jewish religion that claimed to be able to cast out demons, to cast out evil spirits, to exorcise, exorcise these demons from others. Well, it refers to some that were doing that, the itinerant Jewish exorcist, and they did it in the name of Solomon. So it was a, it was a group that claimed, you know, their roots back to Solomon, and, and they would claim to be able to cast out these evil spirits uh, in the name of Solomon. So they took it upon themselves then because they saw, look, these Paul, he can cast out demons by whose name? Jesus. So it says they took it upon themselves. It's not that God commissioned them to do this. To call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, were they successful in that? No, because they, they didn't have the authority and the, and the gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. And Luke gives us an example of some of these itinerant Jewish exorcists that, that tried to, to do that. Look now at verse 14. It says, Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. So they claimed to have this power to cast out demons. And it says that um, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now, how did this help the work of Jesus when this man, demon-possessed man, basically jumped on and prevailed against these Jewish itinerant exorcists? How did that help the, the work of Christ? What's that? I couldn't hear you a little. It increased the work. I mean, they, they could see the real thing and something that's not real. Something that just claims to be the real thing, but it's just a cheap imitation. You know, when, when uh, I uh, spent a, uh, about a week in Nashville when I was in college, one summer I spent a week in Nashville and we went to a restaurant to eat and they had chili and, and it just that just sounded good to me and so I ordered chili in Tennessee Tennesseans I'm, I'm sorry anyone here from Tennessee um, they don't know how to make chili I mean I kind of got this gravy with meat kind of dish and I looked at it and I tasted it and this is not the real thing I mean and you appreciate the real thing when you're shown something that's not the real thing and and that's what they saw you know this is just a cheap imitation this isn't the real thing Paul has the real thing he's got the power to do this so there has to be divinity, there has to be deity, there has to be God behind what Paul is doing. And so this incident of, of these Jewish exorcists failing to cast out the demon, that just pointed to the people again, yeah, there are false prophets out there, there are false claims out there, there are things that are not of God out there. Paul has the real thing. And in fact, look in verse 18. It says, And many who had believed came, confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic 
brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So, I mean, they could see the real thing and they could see real, divine, supernatural power that is backing the message that Paul is proclaiming. Again, you know, the emphasis wasn't in the miracles, so we got to be careful we remember why those miracles were performed. It was to confirm the message. And what was the message? That Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus has set up this spiritual kingdom in which all men, both Jews and Gentiles, can be a part of that spiritual kingdom. And we see those who really were converted. Paul gives us an example of that in verse 19. Those that had been practicing some of the magic arts that were popular uh, among the, 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 the Gentile religions... I mean, they brought their books because that's what they would confer with. Someone would have a dream, they would open up their books and give them the interpretation of that dream. Someone needed a charm or a curse to put on somebody else. They would open up their books and it would give them the charm or the curse that this particular person needed. And those books were valuable. I mean, you couldn't go out and buy a paperback copy of those books. I mean, these were bound, written on leather, uh, and, and handed down from generation to generation. These books were, were believed to be endued with power themselves, and they were willing to give all that up. They were willing to take those books that they had revered and burn them in the sight of all as a demonstration that what we had was not true. What Paul has is the truth. And so it just shows that, that he was making a big impact on the area, on not only Ephesus, but word of that was spreading out from Ephesus. And a lot of people were being converted to the way of Christ. Well, verse 21 tells us, when these things were accomplished... Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Now, Paul gets his wishes, uh, maybe not in the manner that he's planning here in verse 21, but he's saying, I'm still, you know, I'm not finished with my trip. I'm going to go on up through uh, Macedonia. That's where Philippi, uh, Thessalonica were located. Then I'm going to go on down into Achaia. Well, what's, who's in Achaia? What church is in Achaia? Corinth is in Achaia. So he's going to go down through there. Then he says, from there, I'm planning to go back to Jerusalem. And then after I'm in Jerusalem, I'd like to go meet the brethren in Rome as well. Now, did that happen? Yeah, when he was imprisoned in Jerusalem. And then appealed to Caesar. And then was, was taken to Rome after that. But first he's, he's going to go up where Thessalonica is, Philippi is. He says he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So, so to get things ready and to let the brethren know that Paul's coming, uh, he sends Timothy and Erastus on up into Mas- Macedonia. They're going to uh, travel by ship through the Aegean Sea, and we'll look at a map next time of those places, uh, but he's gonna, they're, they're going to prepare for Paul coming, get the churches ready uh, for him coming, and he's staying there in Ephesus for a little bit longer, and this is when the riot uh, breaks out. Look at verse 23 now, Acts 19, 23. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of... Now, I'm reading from New King James, which says Diana. But but in in the Greek manuscripts, it uses actually the Greek term and the Greek name of this goddess, which would be Artemis. 
So he, he made silver shrines of Artemis or Diana. And, and here's the point in verse 24. What does that last phrase in verse 24 say? Good business. This was a very successful business. Brought no small profit to the craftsmen. So the tourism, I mean, again, remember this temple is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And people flock from all over the empire to see this incredible structure, this temple of Artemis or temple of Diana. And the silversmiths crafted these small replicas of the idol of Diana and it brought them a lot of money. Well, when Paul began to persuade the people and tell them Diana is not a goddess, she's been made by hands, that's not going to set very well with them. So we're going to stop right there and uh, we'll take up with, uh, with the riot at Ephesus Wednesday night. Thank you all very much.